Hi, everyone. Hope you're having, uh, so far, a great day. We're actually uh, here in New Jersey, and uh, it's definitely a beach day. So wherever you are, I hope after this you'll maybe go for a little walk. Okay, so uh, we'll get started. Our presentation is how to comply with the CARE Act. So what we're going to do is walk you through uh, what we think are some of the salient points and main tenants and interesting factoids uh, relating to the CARE Act and caregivers and how that relates in parallel with improving HCAP scores and audits and measurements. And most importantly, um, affecting positively people's lives, actually both your staff at a hospital to help them uh, through their day perform uh, better actions with more people and help the patients and the caregivers at the same time. So what I'm going to do is introduce the players. Uh, so myself, I have a 20 plus years, I'm a behavioral technologist. So my background actually is in how to interact digitally and mobily with people within their lifestyle that engenders motivation, nurturing, and puts people in a way that they're more likely to take an action that makes sense at the time. So uh, a lot of the strategy is a, a whole science and behavioral engagement method and algorithm around how to take typical healthcare content and break it up into snackable, digestible bites that could also be in a two-way digital dialogue. So that's my background. Uh, you'll also hear from Shelly Schoenfeld. Shelly has over uh, 20 years in working with hospitals and all different types of solutions uh, for hospitals. So I think she has a great, you know, fresh perspective. And then Jane Miller uh, heads all our client services in healthcare, and she's actively involved in uh, dozens of patient engagement programs, you know, around the United States. We talked a little bit about, you know, the overview, so I'm going to go first, talk about the role of the Caregiver, the Caregiver Act, and how uh, our concierge care solution could make uh, any provider compliant with that act. And then we'll talk a little bit about inpatient experience and satisfaction and, and a concierge care, an actual use case too. So I think it should be a good, fun-filled uh, session. Just one little note before I begin on a personal uh, basis is my parents are no longer living, but uh, when they were having a lot of problems when they were older, you know, I was one of the caregivers, and it was a very frustrating experience because naturally none of the doctors, nurses, providers, clinicians wanted to really talk to me because they already gave the instructions to my parents. My parents really couldn't follow it too well, so I kind of didn't know what to do. I wasn't that effective and everyone was frustrated and ended up being more unnecessary visits, calls back to the hospital and doctor. So it's kind of, uh, I've been through this and it was a very frustrating experience. So my personal goal is to create behavioral engagement methods and solutions that make it easier and uh, more comfortable for others. Um, and you could see the role of the caregiver is you know a 450 uh, billion dollar job, so it is uh, non-trivial. Uh, a lot of people now with the aging population are caregivers. I just heard a fact on the radio the other day that said uh, girls who are born or were born in the last few years have a 50 percent chance of living to 100. 5-0, right? Um, God knows what happens to us guys, but the girls can live to 100. So, but, but just think about that. That's even more caregivers, you know, as, as they get um, older. And you, if the caregivers are providing $450 billion in value, you know, I always think of uh, economic terms for the industry and our clients. Well, 
in the healthcare industry with the new reimbursement models around capitation and a lot of dollars being squeezed out of the system, the more clinicians in a hospital, for example, or a healthcare plan could get a caregiver to provide needed services, the less it costs them, right? If you just think about it from a pure, if, if you were the CFO, right? So the more we can have a caregiver do, the less everyone else needs to do, and if you think about it, it probably results in less unnecessary visits that are not reimbursable and all those things. So the strategy is how can we get people to provide uh, free labor, so to speak, and it's a willing audience who wants to provide free labor. We just need to empower them. So that's our job. Um, and, you know, it's just pervasive on the caregiving side. You know, this is an interesting um, slide, I find, um, on all the different types of things that a caregiver does. So the question is, if they're doing these activities that you see on the screen, what is helpful to them to make them highly effective, right? If you were a caregiver, what would you find helpful? And I, and I think you're going to see how um, – there's an art and science to that, and we're going to take you through that. Uh, but but we believe, and uh, we have a really neat way of doing that, and we're out there doing it today. So we'll kind of get to that in a little bit. Okay, so now we're going to spend a little time, you know, overviewing uh, the CARE Act. And, uh, you know, again, from my own personal experience and what I've seen, a, a lot out there, I, I think, you know, it makes a lot of sense. Now, it does, it, it's just another thing that clinicians and people in the healthcare industry have to be compliant for. So, on one hand, it's a pain, and how do you do that, and all those things, but if you reverse that and say, okay, how do we take advantage of this, and how does that help us, I believe for the right approach, it could actually help the brand of a hospital, a health care plan, you know, people involved in this. It can help them deliver more cost-effective solutions, and it can actually help them get referrals and more business if you get caregivers saying, wow, uh, you know, th th they're really helping me be a caregiver. So I think there, you got to look at the opportunity side while you're covering your downside risk and how to be compliant with the uh, CARE Act. Okay, so there's, these are the main tenets of the legislation that exists out there, right? So it it's involves designating, notifying, and instructing, right? And, and the real key, 80, 90% of the interactions is more on the instruction side, right? You know, there's a one-time action to get a caregiver to onboard into how you're going to do that, right? And then there's some notification about movement, but it's really interacting with them within the patient and their lifestyle to get them to be an effective uh, caregiver. And we're actually going to walk you through how our concierge care solution uh, hits on these tenants and makes it easy and cost effective for providers to comply with the CARE Act. Okay, so um, you can see the states in which it has been enacted and uh, recently passed and, you know, upcoming uh, legislation. You know, for me, I'd like to see it in Hawaii so I can take a, you know, a visit. But being from Jersey, I do that in the winter, you know, not the summer. But anyway, uh, it's the CARE Act rolling across the U.S. and, uh we think it's going to be adopted in more and more places because it just makes sense for all parties if you can do it well. So then the question is, what's the effect on the provider community, right, on hospitals? You know, everything from economic effect to operational effect to how it affects their staff, right, and all those things. And, and those are things we wrestle with every day, you know, here at GOMO Health in helping our clients with that. Interestingly enough, um, there's a high amount of readmittance because of 
as an example of what I talked about with my parents, because when you're out of the hospital, uh, you, there's so many things you need to know and think about and do and, you know, uh, handing people or their family just, you know, discharge documents and content about what to do. It's not with them all the time. They don't read it all the time. They forget it. So you need a really a way of interacting with them throughout their day. And interestingly enough, the problem of readmittance has really even become a greater economic burden to hospitals and the provider community and plan community with the increase of people on, uh, you know, Medicare, Medicaid, and dual eligible population in that we all know uh, that the whole reimbursement model is moving toward a capitation model where um, quality of care. So if you're readmitted for X number of things within the first 30, 60, 90 or so days, there's no reimbursement. So how do we help a caregiver and the patient only use the ED or only come back or call when it makes sense, right? And because otherwise the provider side has to perform the services, there's no dollars associated with it. The hospital challenges with the CARE Act, you know, naturally each of you out there may have very specific challenges associated with the type of hospital you are and the types of services, but in general, you know, you can see on the screen uh, the issues in applying the CARE Act. Um, the other uh, piece of it is, you know, caregivers don't stop when the patient leaves the hospital. In fact, arguably, that's when they really begin or provide much more services. So you kind of need a 360-degree view of the patient, the caregiver, and how that affects your staff and how you apply that staff to engaging people within their lifestyle, both when they're in the hospital and out of the hospital, right? Um, and, and that's really what it comes down to. Can you have the voice of care reflected in digital forum, right, versus it's just all from the humans that work, the clinician side of the hospital. And that's what we're going to talk about, you know, how to extend the voice of care digitally to people that can interact with them and that builds a relationship and helps people in their uh, daily life. And that's what we're going to really uh, cover. Now, before we get into that, just some interesting uh, facts. Um, you know, 90% of adults have a cell phone and uh, a majority of 65 and older. And, you know, I notice uh, with a lot of kids, including my kids and uh, uh, my wife's mother, the grandparent, the only way she could really interact with the grandkids is text, you know. So, so a lot of the grandparents have become texters just to interact with the kids because uh, they're not as good verbally, but they certainly love to text. So now if you look at typical caregivers, we have three shots, you know, of typical caregivers. Uh, they're clearly uh, on the go, they're working, they're busy, or they're in helping, they got a lot going on, right? So being able to send them snackable, digestible bites of information you know, throughout their day, okay, as opposed to going to a portal, right, or going to an app all the time. People just don't do that. They don't have the time for it. The, the, the best thing we all want in life, and this is true with all of us, just if we, you can help someone out in the moment, okay, what do I need to do now? What do I need to know now? How can you help answer my question now, right? So, and, and th that's how you have to think. How can we deliver stuff to people when they need to act? Because then you have uh, three to five times more likely that they will actually take that action if you're delivering it in the moment when they need to act as opposed to just a checklist that they can go to. Um, so in general, uh, you know, I don't have to belabor this, you know, like I did 10 years ago about the use of cell phones and mobile and 
all those things is clearly it's a mobile world and people are using their phones a lot. Now, interestingly enough, for example, what we do communicates to phones, tablets, PCs, uh, all, all different types of um, interactions could happen. But we found not only in the U.S., but globally, we do work in m most of the continents around the globe that the most effective is short, quick messaging via people's cell phone, especially as a caregiver, you know, make the most sense. Okay, so now we're going to sort of take it down a step from, uh, you know, 100,000 foot view to 50,000 and down more. Um, what does this really mean for a hospital and how do we help more specifically uh, be compliant with the CARE Act, but I would say exceed the intent of the CARE Act and really elevate the brand of the hospital in their community, right? So it's elevate the brand, reduce cost of compliance. So I'm not going to cover this whole wheel, but now we're going to get into um, what we call our concierge care solution. So we have our Gomo Health is our division here, and concierge care is the name of the solution that provides the CARE Act compliance and it can be used in the hospital, out of the hospital. And we have content and a whole turnkey solution in about 15 different kind of therapeutic area and disease states. And we're able to create any new type of engagement protocol, uh, like we're working on some things centered around cancer. Uh, within about two months, we can create any new protocol in our system. So it can be used by many different therapeutic and disease state areas and service lines within a hospital to communicate. And really the way it works is it, it can start when someone's admitted and it clearly continues uh, at discharge. So now you're helping the people throughout you know, their daily life. And really in the end of the day, what are some of the benefits and how does it work? How does the software work? And we're about to get into an actual example, but you can see uh, some of these listed right now. I'm not going to go uh, through them. In the end of the day, I feel it makes people, what, what does concierge care do? It's sort of like the reason why we named it concierge care is it sort of mimics what a concierge would do or what a nurse would do with someone if they were able to be by their side talking and dialoguing throughout their day, right? So it's a real concierge service. It goes to the person. It doesn't rely on them going to an app or portal. It communicates to you the information you need when you need it. So it makes people feel good, and it actually makes them feel that they can accomplish the task and feel empowered. And that's also true. One interesting thing we've learned, it's also true on the clinical side. You know, a lot of our clients, as an example, the nurse caseworkers are overwhelmed. They may have 250 cases each, a lot of them high risk. They can't possibly feel good that they're doing a great job, and that's what they communicate to us. We don't feel we're able to do our best with all the patients. Well, our conscientious care solution is almost like their virtual assistant. It's their voice. They could be having lunch while concierge care is communicating and dialoguing with all 250 of their patients and their caregivers. So maybe it gives them back a little bit of a life and helps the people and builds a relationship. Okay. Um, again, we have a lot of different healthcare organizations that um, we work with to provide uh, these types of services, and you can see a few uh, listed here. Um, now what I'm going to do is get into some actual examples so you can kind of get a more deeper flavor. So now we're taking it down, you know, a little deeper. So the idea is what is it that we do? Well, we have a cloud, concierge care is a cloud-based system, so there's nothing to install, right? People uh, on board opt in, you sign them up. There's a variety of ways to do that, and we have a whole program around that and they're in the system, and then it communicates with the patients and caregivers in, uh, based on the agreed upon communications protocol for that area and throughout their day. 
So we are experts, world-class experts at taking a lot of complex or a lot of content and breaking them up. Our whole system is designed to break them up into these quick, short, easy to digest information and allows feedback and interaction and it has a business rules engine. So based on an interaction, it could send you other information, right? And the care messages, that's what we call the actual physical delivery of the messages. The care messages could be in a lot of different formats, text, email, chat, and others. And because of the HIPAA in the US, depending on the conversation that you need, uh, as an example, our chat works in a HIPAA secure mode uh, if you need that for that particular conversation or protocol. So you can mix and match how you communicate to people based on if you need HIPAA compliance. And we're, we, we also, because we work with dozens and dozens of healthcare organizations, we can help you and your compliance department also render an opinion about HIPAA, not HIPAA, and how that works, okay, you know, in that. Um, so in this case, uh, Carla, uh, the woman on the right, is the caregiver for her father, Andrew. He was recently released from the hospital. He's a diabetic, and he has new meds and a wound because he fell. And Carla really doesn't have medical training, and she's a little nervous, but uh, she wants to do a really good job for her dad, right? So, you know, what I'm going to walk you through is a little bit of, uh, of an example of that, but basically Carla signs up for our concierge care program, and now Carla's going to be getting messages that make sense uh, to help her with her dad, um, Andrew. Okay, so, you know, in addition to any of the stacks of paper that Carla and Andrew may have been given at discharge, uh, Carla's on the concierge care system from the hospital, and she's getting different information, and she could also be asked some questions that can actually help deliver more contextually relevant, you know, information to her. Um, so you can see here the information she gets in concierge care, it comes in the form of uh, text content, it comes in the form of videos, images, you know, there's all different ways of delivering, you know, the content, and we can deliver the content in a way so that anybody on any cell phone could see it, and it could get more intelligent as you have a smartphone or other, you know, devices. So the, the, the content is in a multimedia, you know, format. And you can see here, you know, Carl is very busy, and the idea is simplicity. Again, we all want that. Simple works, okay? So it could be, a, you know, messages, okay, now's the time to take the medicine. Um, and there's a variety of ways, you know, of doing this on how do we know when is the time, right? We, we interface with uh, different PBM, pharmacy benefit management systems, the ones you may have. Uh, it could be that a nurse or, in fact, the caregiver or patient puts it in. So there's a, a, a lot of pretty simple ways we have of integrating data into the system that allows us to present contextually relevant information. Uh, and also, based on our concierge care science I was talking about, our behavioral science, you know, there are uh, motivational and other messages that build trust, credibility, because you want to intermix just pure medical content with lifestyle stuff, because w one of the most important behavioral characteristics to build is resiliency. A lot of issues happen because people are not resilient. They get off the drug. They don't do what they're supposed to do, right? I know every year I say I'm gonna go to the gym four times a week and I never make it, so the point is, how do you help people throughout the day with little encouragement? So this is like a little encouragement message. So we, again, we know where and when to sprinkle in some of those uh, based on uh, our behavioral engagement science and algorithms. 
And then here's a little story for Carla uh, about another caregiver in a similar situation and what she's going through. And so uh, it's, it's, not, it's not only helping Carla, but she feels really connected. So the, the, the most important thing about all of this, and here's some questions for her that she can answer, and it could actually go into our uh, chat product. We, based on a business rule and what you as a hospital organization allow, based on an answer or an action, we could actually connect them to a call center or to a particular uh, clinician. And we have a relationship with some of the top nurse triage call centers in the country, so we could even provide that level of you know, service for remote care if that's uh, needed, right? So it can go from an all digital conversation to one in which there's a clinician or pharmacist or nutritionist or nurse on the back end to communicate to them. All right, so the, I'm gonna turn over the presentation uh, to Shelly in a second, but the, I just wanna end where I began and say that as you can see, I know we went quickly and we touched on it, but you can see if you can help Carla in this case and help Andrew through Carla, Carla will talk about it. She'll talk about it in her social network. She'll tweet about it, put it up on Facebook. And your brand, the brand providing this level of concierge care messaging and in-the-moment lifestyle will benefit because she could be at lunch and saying to her friends, look at this message I got from my hospital to help me with my dad. Oh, who gave you that? Oh, this hospital. Oh, I don't get that, right? So it could be very, very powerful. Um, so um, thank you, everyone, for listening, and uh, we hope to follow up with you in the future. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, Shelly now. Good morning, everyone. Um, so Bob took us through the CARE Act and what is required of hospitals and how that will affect the caregiver and their patients. I'm going to back up a little bit and talk about not just discharge, but backing it up to that first encounter that the patient has and that their family has with the hospital and the real first opportunity to make an impression, to build your brand, to establish that foundational communication with the patient and with their caregiver and family members in an effort to make their experience a positive one and um, have them appreciate a good impression from the hospital. We know, as Bob uh, just alluded to, it's a customer-centric market even when it comes to healthcare these days. And patients and caregivers have the opportunity to choose their health care. They're an empowered population. So in dealing with out-migration and so many options that are available to patients and their families these days, it's imperative to do what we can to deliver to them the information and the care that they need so that your brand, your hospital, your services, your phys physicians and caregivers are the ones who are top of mind when they're making those healthcare decisions. Um, we're looking at some current statistics right now where inpatient satisfaction is on a decline, keeping in mind it's only June and we're already seeing a 3% decrease in patient satisfaction. So likely that that is on a, a downward trend and it's our opportunity to affect that and improve that. We know that HCAP scores are hugely important to hospitals from a reimbursement standpoint and the patient satisfaction surveys that patients receive post-discharge give them the opportunity to provide feedback that directly affects those reimbursements. So rather than waiting until that patient is discharged from the hospital to begin supporting them and communicating with them and find out what is their issue and what was their experience when they were an inpatient, we have stepped back a couple paces and started to address that right when they were in the hospital. This inpatient satisfaction program is really directly connected to supporting those patients as soon as they come into the hospital, as soon as they're admitted, as soon as they're registering. It's uh, quite a customer-centric approach and it allows them to voice their needs and the hospital to deliver those needs and the clinical care team to deliver on those needs 
and ensure uh, a positive experience for the patient and their family rather than hearing that it might not have been the best experience for them once they've left the hospital and receive an HCAP survey two weeks after they've been discharged. So I'm going to start um, taking you through the solution, which really is a mobile solution that allows them to communicate their non-clinical needs once they've been admitted to the hospital, once they're in patients. It's um, an interactive communication, it's an interactive solution, and ultimately, as I mentioned, the goal is to improve their inpatient experience establishing a strong communication foundation, and once they leave, they have that positive impression, they've been discharged, they have a great impression of the hospital, of the clinical care team, of the communication, of their importance to you as a customer, and post-discharge, they can you can continue that communication and continue to support them as active members in the care continuum with the concierge care content that Bob was describing. So, how does it work? I'm gonna take you through a real uh, detailed uh, chart of how it works for the patient, but essentially what happens is they opt in for the program. We'll show you various ways that they can do that. And by opting in for to participate or linking up to the program, actually, they have the opportunity to voice any non clinical care need, be it uh, their room is cold, there's uh, a noise, heavy noise outside their room, they need a blanket, they need their garbage empty, they need help going to the bathroom or with their bedpan anything from food service or environmental services. So they can really express those non-clinical needs through this program. And again, it's continuing with that concierge care approach that so many consumers are really looking for, whether they're in a restaurant or in a shopping mall or in a hospital. They're looking to be the number one customer and to be appreciated as such. So this program enables them to do that and to express their need and for the hospitals to deliver. And here's how it works. There's a number of ways that the patients can participate in the program, either once they register or are admitted to the hospital, as their paperwork is being processed and their information is being captured, they can offer up their name, their contact information, and they're told at registration, we have a program where you can communicate directly through your mobile, you can tell us, or your uh, tablet, you can tell us exactly what you need and somebody from that department will respond to you and get you what you need in real time. So they're told at registration about it. Should they elect to participate then, um, as part of the registration process, it's indicated that they want to be part of the program and that information on the back end is delivered directly through the application. And once that patient then opts in or, or says that they would like access to that program, they receive a text message or a notification, it can be an email as well and they click on that link, their information is pre-populated, they have their name, their room number, their bed number is pre-populated, and all they need to do is request those of those green horizontal options on the mobile that you see. They can request the department that they need and make their specific request, and they'll be visited by somebody from that department who can help them out in making their room warmer or getting them their blanket or getting them a hot cup of coffee. So they can do that at registration. If at registration they're unsure if they want access to that program, they can also log in and access through a URL or text into a short code to gain access to the program. We have uh, marketing materials that we work on to promote the program throughout the hospitals, posters and signage and posters in the room and in the elevators so that everybody's aware of the opportunity. And um, once they do that, if they don't opt in at, at registration, the only difference is they're plugging in their name, their room number, and their bed number, plug in their request, and within minutes, somebody's in their room helping them to address their pain level, or if they wanna speak to a clergy member, or maybe speak to a patient advocate, they might have questions about process or billing. Um, our programs are also multilingual, so it addresses language needs as well. It's a real patient-centered approach to delivering them what they need. And that, uh, that diagram really sums it up as far as how it flows and how the process goes. And again, this is an inpatient experience. What Jane will now take you through is some of our outpatient tools and content that we can deliver to keep that relationship going with the patient. 
Hi, I'm Jane Miller, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about the concierge care program. Um, you know, over 80% of health care costs are due to chronic disease. So if there is a way that you can help people manage their chronic disease, that goes a long way towards improving health care, reducing ED readmission, and um, increasing patient satisfaction. And that's where we tend to focus. So we have uh, content. We've developed content for a whole variety of chronic care conditions, diabetes, asthma, um, hypertension, uh, prenatal, which I know doesn't tie in so much to the CARE Act, but it certainly does tie into what hospitals are doing. And we have content, and we can also work with your content if you have content. And the idea of these programs is that by connecting with patients, sending out messaging, having an ongoing conversation with them after they leave the hospital when they don't have so much contact with the doctors and nurses, you, you can reduce costs, you can reduce readmission by improving the communication. You can encourage and reinforce patient compliance, reminding them to take their medications, go to the doctor, uh, get a lab test, whatever it is the patient needs. And you can increase overall satisfaction for both the patient and the caregiver, which of course will always help the hospital with HCAPs and everything else. We have developed a, a wide array of content. We have uh, content uh, text messaging, and we have uh, what we call quick pages, mobile web pages, as well as uh, video content that we use. Uh, we provide content in the different areas we're talking about, diabetes, asthma, and so forth. We can also work with your content. If you have particular content, we can take your content and convert it to this format. And we can also tweak the content. For example, I've been involved in a maternity program where they didn't want to use our standard program, but they wanted to focus on very specific issues. Um, women who are pregnant but, but are uh, drink or smoke or obese, things like that. So in that case, we tweak content to meet their specific focus. I'm going to talk about diabetes and use that as an example of the types of programs we have. So every person is not the same. And we do need to communicate to people in different ways. But of course, doing an individualized communication to every single person can be challenging. So we've created, we've templated it in a way that it can be both configured and personalized, but yet you can have a standard set of rules. So that you're engaging people and you make it feel like it is directed at them, but you can do it in a standard way. We generally start with what we call an onboarding survey. And this is a survey where we can figure out the, the patient's medical issues as well as their emotional issues. Because we need to know not only, you know, if it's a diabetes patient, are they on insulin? Because if they're on insulin, you're going to send them different messaging and handle them differently than if they're not on insulin or if they're pre-diabetic or if they have type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes. But there's also the emotional questions. Are they able to care for themselves? If you have someone who is versus someone who isn't, um, th then you really have a different risk level. You need more monitoring for someone who really is not comfortable caring for themselves or doesn't have a caregiver to support them. The messages are generally personalized. They're, um, our, all of our content is reviewed by health experts. We generally write things at fifth grade reading level. That's uh, what's standard in the industry. We provide all of our content in English and Spanish. We can certainly provide other languages as well, if that's what you require. Generally, when we send out content, generally about a third of it is just a regular text message. And if you prefer email, we could do that as well. About a third of it will connect to uh, a video, a short video, maybe anywhere from 30 seconds to two, three minutes on a particular topic. Or it might connect to what we call a quick page, which is a mobile web page that, again, deals with one topic. Like here, we're talking about eating right at special events. If someone doesn't have a smartphone, the content can be viewed on a tablet. It can be viewed on a PC. So really, it will work on, on any uh, digital medium that they have. And then there's all different types of content that is provided. But it can be 
messages where it's uh, reminding people to take medication. It can be motivational type messaging, maybe uh, a coupon type of thing, like we're involved in a program which actually gives out uh, prescriptions for buying fruits and vegetables, trying to get people to eat more fruits and vegetables. It can be uh, two-way messaging. So we're involved in another program that talks that deals with pain management, and people are asked uh, like every few days, "What's your level of pain?" Rated on a scale of one to ten, and they reply back with their rating. Based on their rating, based on how they rated their pain last week, it sends them back a response. So you can have a whole conversation that's all fully templated, but yet is very uh, personalized to the person's specific situation. So there's many different ways to do this, and then of course with the chat you can do a nurse triage where you actually have the nurse communicating. And that just is, so I'm just trying to give you a quick overview of the program. If anyone has any questions or comments, feel free to type it into the text box. You can access that through the little text bubble that's next to the phone in the Join Me application. All right, we have a question here. What would it take to get started? So really, typically, it's a few-step process where if a hospital or healthcare organization was interested, we would talk to them about their specific need and situation. We would typically do a, a session like this, very focused on that. We'd customize our program for them, right? And then should they sign off on it, we have an internal you know, kick off, and it's not just the solution, but as Shelly said, we review with them how to market and communicate, how to onboard, right? So we really take a whole turnkey approach, and then we stay with that in providing that turnkey service. And since it's a cloud-based system, it's fairly easy and cost-effective to start and you don't have to start in the whole hospital. You can start with, let's say, a therapeutic or disease state area that you're having the most cost or most issues with or where you need caregivers the most or interact with patients the most. So that's typically the program. And really, from when someone signs up, you know, depending on the level of customization, they could be typically up and running in two to three months. Okay, there's another question here. Do we have to install anything? There's nothing you need to install. Everything is cloud-based. Uh, this certainly could be done with an app, but generally we do it with mobile web. And the reason is then you are device agnostic. You can work with any smartphone, any tablet. Uh, one of our programs, the uh, inpatient experience, we're actually talking to one hospital about having the survey up on the TV in the room. The, all the patients would have a keyboard and then they could fill in the form on the TV in the room. So it, it just gives you so much flexibility by doing this way. So there's nothing you need to install. All you need is an internet connection. Thank you, Jane. Okay, we have another question. How many different disease state programs can we run? There are various uh, disease states that we address, and it's interesting that we often get this question, and really the disease states that we've developed have been based on our customers' and partners' needs. So depending on your key therapeutic areas or the ones that you're looking to support, what your inpatient uh, data recommends based on the number of uh, procedures or patients or your centers of excellence, that, of course, will drive the specific therapeutic areas that you're looking to support. So we have a number of many, many existing programs, and we're also building new programs daily based on what our partners are looking to support based on their patient volumes. And, and Shelly, typically we'd start with one or two or three. Like, what is a typical oh, hospital? Oh, sure. So, so we... Exactly. We can start with one or we can start with many and then the surveys are customized to be sure that we're delivering the right content to the right patient. Yeah. And also because con the uh, concierge care system has what's called access control levels, if you have a service line 
you know, you we could configure it that they only see their data, their patients, right, versus another service line, okay? And if you have a centralized call center, they can see all of it if you want them to, right? So depending on how you work your current communications protocols and clinical support, our system could be configured to allow access in that same way. All right, we have another question. What about security? Jane, would you like to take this one? Sure. And um, security, that, that's uh, very broad because there's really two different types. There's, uh, you know, security of the data and then there's HIPAA compliance. And of course, both are extremely important. So in terms of security of the data, uh, we, we store, we actually store as little data about the uh, patient as possible. But you know we do keep it in a secure environment on our servers. If we do interface with the, when we interface with the hospital and we pull data, we use HL7, uh, which is the hospital standard for maintaining a secure connection um, and and for data sharing. In terms of HIPAA compliance, some of this, uh, if you're dealing with anything that is very patient specific, obviously it has to be HIPAA compliant. Um, so that's why we have the chat secure so if you're doing generalized compliance information like educating people on diabetes that does not necessarily require it does not doesn't have to be HIPAA secure so that can be done over regular text but if you're having a conversation you know going back to Bob's example of the wound management where the woman felt that uh, her father, she was concerned about how her father's wound was healing. If you have something like that, and now you're going to have a conversation with a nurse, that's going to be done through our secure chat so that you do meet the HIPAA requirements. It would not be done over regular text. And everything that we have that is web based, the surveys, the chats, uh, the uh, quick pages, all of that is on an SSL connection. So it is all secure. All right. Thank you, Jane. Our next question is, what data or measurements can you provide for the programs? Yeah, so I think, you know, we're, we're doing this in many different places and naturally, you know, the data is very specific to our particular clients. You know, on a one-on-one -on -one basis, we're happy to share more uh, about that, but naturally, you know, None, 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 of, none of our clients want us giving out their kind of data, so we just don't do that. But again, uh, if we're talking to any of you individually, we're happy to share some generalized information and data associated with that. And there's certainly, we collect the data on all of the opt-in subscribers, the messages that have been delivered, um, the videos that have been viewed or accessed and um, all of the survey data. So as Jane spoke to the onboarding survey and then there are periodic surveys throughout the life of the program to be sure that the content is being well received to see if folks are looking for other information that might not have yet been covered, um, if they've accessed any physicians or hospital services based on the information that they've learned about. So all of that data is available through our reporting and analytics through our platform and we can we have the ability, of course, to uh, run that for our partners, or many of them we train, and they can access all of the data in real time so that they can see uh, trending and, and patient response. We can also do comparative data, onboarding survey midway through the program to see how that needle has been moved based on further educating these patients. All right, if there are no more questions, I would like to thank you all for joining our seminar today. And if you have any further questions or want to know more, please feel free to contact us. You can contact us at info at gomohealth.com or the number on the screen. So thank you all for coming today, and we look forward to speaking with you.